to be here today. Today I am here to talk to you all about um, my recent book, which came out in December, called Hidden Human Computers. And um, my relationship to this is a family relationship. And so a lot of people who have seen the movie Hidden Figures have come out of the movie and said, I had no idea. I have to admit, I've known this story my whole life. Um, my legal name is actually Miriam. I come from a Southern family, so I didn't know my name was Miriam until I went to kindergarten. Um, <laughs> It's true. When I was two weeks old, my family just said, well, we're not going to call her that. We'll just call her Duchess. So then when they signed me up for kindergarten, um, I was like, who's Miriam? And I'm not answering to that. <laughs> and I never did. And so um, I, I get paychecks with Duchess on it, and I cash them. It works out just fine. <laughs> Um, I, however, was named after my maternal grandmother who passed away two years before I was born. She passed away in 1967. I was the youngest of the grandkids, so I was the only one that didn't meet her. And um, I was born in 1969, which is also the year that we went to the moon. And so they said, of course, we have to name her after the grandma who worked at NASA. So let me tell you a little bit about her. My grandmother was born in 1907 in Covington, Georgia, and she was privileged enough to actually have a college degree. Now, if you know anything about American history, this is extremely unusual because she was born only 60 years after slavery ended. She went to Talladega College and she majored in chemistry. When she finished Talladega, she went back to Covington and she was going to be a teacher and she met a young man who was also interested in teaching. He convinced her to marry him and to leave Covington and go to Hampton, Virginia. He was asked to be a professor at what was then called Hampton Institute, which is now Hampton University. This also was kind of unusual because if you know anything about historically black colleges, they were started at the end of the Civil War. They were started by white people and the original faculty were white. So the fact that my grandfather got to teach at Hampton was a pretty big deal. So they started their life in Hampton and um, went on about to have um, three kids. And it wasn't until World War II broke out that um, NASA Langley realized they didn't have enough people to work there. The majority of the employees at NASA were white men, which would make sense, that's the time period. And so the men went off to war. And so at that moment, they said, okay, we'll see if we can find enough college-educated white women. And in the 1940s, it was still unusual for white women to have college degrees. So they recruited as many white women as they could, but they ran out of them. So it was at that moment that they said, we'll go over to the colored school and see if there are enough colored girls who can pass this test. And so um, my grandmother was actually 36 at the time and had an eight-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a six-year-old. And she and 10 other black women passed the test and they started working at NASA in 1943. And so um, it's a story I've always known, but a story that I didn't appreciate until I went to college. And so um, I was a typical teenager. Anything my parents told me that was supposed to be interesting about my family, I thought was ridiculous. Um, <laughs> My mom is 81, she revels in the fact that she told me so. Not only that, she revels in the fact that I have three kids now and two are teenagers and they think that all of this is ridiculous. Um, and in fact, my 10 year old, when the movie came out, insisted that he see Rogue One first. <sighs> true story, true story. There's no love when you're the mom. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my, so if you've seen Hidden Figures, you know that the movie takes place in 61 and 62. But there's this whole arc of a story that happens before that. And so that's one of the things I talk about in my book. So today, one of the things I'll share with you is how I came about writing this book, because that in and of itself is a process. So first and foremost, when you're an academic, the only thing you really care about is getting tenure, right? And so um, I knew that this couldn't be the tenure project because I wasn't sure if I could gather all of the material. So I got tenure, then I got promoted from associate professor to full professor, and then I got the most amazing thing you can possibly get as a professor is sabbatical. And and so I was delighted to get sabbatical, which was for the 2013-2014 school year. 
And so in the summer of 2014, I was able to fly to NASA Langley and get a tour of the grounds, go into the archives, and get my research. So the first thing I'll share with you is the thing that surprised me the most with my research, which is that I go into the archive and I find the deed to the land. And what this is, is it shows you is that the grounds of NASA are actually sitting on the property of what had been Chesterville Plantation. Okay, which is pretty amazing. So I don't know how well you can read this. It says next to Chesterville Plantation, then someone has written in in handwriting, Chesterville site, and then they put in parentheses, preferred, to kind of soften the fact that it was a plantation. Like, we're just going to kind of get over that part. Um, so as you see down here at the bottom, it says National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and this is um, the official document from the Historical and Archaeological Society. And so a lot of people will ask, oh, okay, fine, it's Virginia. Virginia was a slave state. How long was it technically a plantation? It was actually legally a plantation until 1950. Now, I feel like I need to say that again. I didn't say 1850, I said 1950. So for the first seven years that my grandmother was working there, that's what the grounds were, okay? And so... Um, you know, hidden is actually more than a metaphor. I would say that it's a very um, warm and fuzzy way of not getting at the fact that you're really talking about federal legal segregation. Okay, so um, this, this is like my point of departure. So this is my former student, and you know, we get through security, we go through, and we go on this research project. And I'm pr very proud to say that um, she's already gotten a master's degree from Brown, and she's a middle school teacher, and she's using this book like sometime like around this week. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah, so, um, it's important to say, how does this work happen? And so there's so many conversations happening about STEM right now and what happens in the space of STEM. But um, one of the things that I say to people all the time is that black women started at NASA in the 1940s, but the story of black women being at NASA wasn't told until 2016. And so one of the things we need to think about is how are these stories told and how do we have this material? And so just the role of the preservation officer, I like to say, is so important for us to think about that it's the people that hold these documents that help us understand the work that happened in these places. So here we are, this is the team. On the end, that's Mary Gaynor, and she's the um, preservation officer. That's my former student, Lucy. Her students now call her Ms. Short. That is me, and that is Margot Lee Shetterly. Now, you know who Margot Lee Shetterly is because she is the author of this book. Right? And so Margot and I collaborated because Margot is a journalist and she had reached out to relatives of former computers to interview them and um, to try to put together her book. We hit it off and built together a nice relationship and actually applied for a grant together from the Virginia Humanities Foundation. And so we did our research together. Margot decided that she wanted to write a book for adults, a mainstream book. Um, and I knew I wanted to do something for the classroom and curriculum. So we ended up doing separate projects. I share this image of the book because um, I have like a bias towards this photograph. The reason why I have a bias is if you look in the front row there to the far left, there's a little short lady with her hair kind of like this. That's my grandmother. And so what that image is, that is um, a picture from the Norfolk Journal and Guide. The Norfolk Journal and Guide was the historically black newspaper from Norfolk, Virginia, that um, said, this is the entering class. It said, paving the way for women engineers. And so at the time, they thought these black women were going to be able to be engineers, but they actually weren't allowed to be engineers. They had to be computers. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more later about what the difference is between the computers and the engineers. Um, but they were originally hopeful. <laughs> 
So Margo then, of course, I didn't realize, used to work for HBO, and she pitched her story for 2000 Fox, and that's how we get the movie. Now, my grandmother worked with all of these women. So in the middle is Taraji Henson, who's playing Katherine Johnson. She's the only one who's still alive. She's 98 years old. If my grandmother was still alive, she'd be turning 110 this year, because she was born in 1907. Um, this is um, Octavia Spencer playing Dorothy Vaughn, and then, of course, Janelle Monet playing Mary Jackson. Um, not only did my grandmother work with all these women, but my mom has amazing, funny stories about these women. So um, the story that, um, I'll tell you two stories that are my favorite stories. So Dorothy Vaughn, um, she ends up becoming a widow, and after she grieves um, the passing of her husband, she ends up spending time with my great uncle. And then at some point, she ended up having a child that miraculously looks sort of like my cousins. Um, and so... <laughs> <laughs> my mom was like, you know, we are connected to those Vaughns. And I was like, I'm not even sure I want to know all about that. Um, but this is what I've been told. Um, the other thing is my mom had her high school graduation party at Mary Jackson's house. And she wouldn't tell me until recently that it was so ruckus that they got kicked out. So, um, so this is like a very personal, familiar story to me. In fact, um, how many of you all have seen the movie? Okay, fantastic. So you've, you've seen the movie where, like, there's the church scene? That's actually the church in town. And so the first time I saw the movie, I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, my cousin got married in that church. Um, and so it's, it's all... Um, you know, resonates um, in, a, in a very particular way. So I, of course, decided that um, I wanted to do this book, which um, is written at an eighth grade level, but I have found that adults really enjoy it because most people just don't know this story. The woman that um, we chose to put on the cover is Melba Roy Moten. She worked at the Maryland NASA, and we chose that picture um, because clearly it's staged. They didn't dress that fancy for work. Um, so she has on her best A-line dress and her pearls, and she's standing next to the newfangled IBM computer, which, you know, at the time was the most cutting edge thing that existed. Okay, so now I will get into what exactly is a computer. Well, as I said before, originally computers were only white women and they were doing computations on machines like this um, or sometimes they were able to do them in their home. What it was is that the engineers did the complicated work. They only allowed the women to check the work. And so people ask me all the time, why um, is this story just about black women and not black men? It's because they didn't want to desegregate engineering. And men wouldn't have been computers. Computers at the time would have been considered like the secretarial pool. So this was women's work. So I have this image up here. These are college-educated black women um, to talk about um, where do you find a talent pool at this time period, given the fact that you really don't have that many educated black people in America. So one of the things I do in my book is give a backdrop of the story of historically black colleges. I live in Minneapolis, St. Paul. I've been teaching there for more than 20 years. In a place like that, students really don't know anything about HBCUs because HBCUs are predominantly in the South. Um, what I found when I wrote my book was that there are actually 10 different NASA spaces. And What's amazing is that eight of them are in former slave states. Now, what does that mean? What that means is that when we went to war and we were tight for talent, they realized they could go to historically black colleges, which is where they popped up in these former slave states, and get this talent. So if you think about Huntsville, Alabama, right? Historically black colleges in Alabama. When you think about Cape Canaveral, there's Florida A&M. Everyone says, can you hear me, Houston? There are four HBCUs around the area of Houston. And so this is what the secret was at the time, because the country was really invested in making sure that we beat the Soviet Union.
So this right here is just an image of a woman that I write about. Her name was Cylon Yates. And I talk about how um, science wasn't something that people thought black women should be doing if they got educated at all. Black women were being steered into teaching, possibly law a little bit, possibly even medicine because they had been midwives. But Cylon Yates somehow ends up heading up natural sciences at Lincoln University, which was in Pennsylvania. And she does that in 1888, which is profound because we've only been out of slavery for 20 years. Um, but there were three historically black colleges that popped up before the Civil War was over, and one of them was Lincoln. And so the historically black colleges that popped up were in Ohio and Pennsylvania because they weren't slave states. So it was Lincoln, Cheney, and Wilberforce. Okay, so People have called me on my information and said, your grandmother couldn't have worked at NASA because it wasn't called that. I'm like, that is true. It wasn't called that in the beginning, but it's a good sound bite, okay? It was originally NACA, all right? So I'm like, I realized that. But, you know, if you do an interview, if you get three minutes on television, it's a big deal. So it was the National Advisory <laughs> Committee of Aeronautics because, of course, it starts with airplanes, right? It's going to originally um, deal with flight. NACA starts in 1915, and it starts doing the Woodrow Wilson administration. The reason why it's important to know that it's Woodrow Wilson is because Woodrow Wilson was a proud racist. A lot of people don't realize that about that. He was a dyed-in-the-wool, unabashed, like um, absolutely unapologetic racist to the point that um, the movie that came out, A Birth of a Nation, which I hope you all have heard about, it's three hours long, black and white movie. They didn't have sound back then. For all intents and purposes, it was um, Klan propaganda. He screened it in the White House and called it History Written in Lightning. Now, the reason why I share that is to underscore the fact that NACA was not really interested in desegregating when it becomes NASA. It's really out of expediency. It's really only because they don't have people to work there. Um, so it wasn't set up um, to be open to people. It just ends up becoming open. So if you move from Woodrow Wilson, this is when you move to FDR. And so this is an image of FDR in 1941 signing the Equal Employment Opportunity Act. And what that does is desegregate federal jobs. Now, the way that that came about, just as Dennis said he learned about Bayard Rustin, um, a. Philip Randolph at the time, who's someone who ends up collaborating with Bayard Rustin, is a labor um, organizer. He wants to have a march on Washington for jobs and freedom. In the early 1940s, FDR is incredibly intimidated by that. So what he does is broker a deal. And he says, if you keep all these black people from coming onto the mall in DC, I will pass this legislation. And so that's what he does. And so once he passes the legislation, the question is which federal entities will be in compliance with the legislation? Because, of course, everyone isn't really comfortable with this idea. And so the first entity is um, NACA. And so this is the image that I was um, sharing with you all, where they decide two years later, fine, we will desegregate and we will allow these women to come work. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, when they got there, what were the working conditions? So one of the things you see in the movie is you see Katherine Johnson's um, character running in between buildings. The music under it is Pharrell, because Pharrell happens to be from Hampton, and so he wanted to participate. It's somewhat lighthearted, right? So the song is like running, you know, and it kind of downplays a little bit how stressful it actually, actually was. So when I went on the grounds of NASA, what I found was that that um, it's laid out like a compound. When I'm in Minnesota, I make the reference of like the Mayo Clinic. The buildings are miles apart from each other. And so what they did was put the black women in the West area. And then by doing that, it was also code language that they would use. They would refer to them as the West area computers. And only the people who knew what that meant knew that those were the black women. So they were completely separate from the white women that worked on the campus. The first 10 years that my grandmother worked at NASA, 
um, she ate at her desk. In the 1950s, which is around the time when Katherine Johnson got there, they modified this building. When I did my research, I got this blueprint, and what this is is a building of where they were eventually allowed to eat. And so if you look in the middle, it says kitchen. It's not that easy to read. What's interesting is that whiteness really wasn't named in mainstream culture, culture until like around the 1990s. But in this blueprint, it says white dining room. And then over here, it says colored dining room. If you know how to read blueprints, next to that are doors. What that meant was that they would go out of those doors, go across campus that way, go back to where they worked, and come, came in over here. If you were to ask white people in the 1950s if black people worked at NASA, they would have said no. They would have said no because they wouldn't have seen them. They wouldn't have been lying. They had no idea. That's how much they were kept apart originally. So how do we make this transition from NACA to NASA? Um, it's NACA from 1915 to 1957. What happens in 1957? The Soviet Union has Sputnik. They get out of space first. The United States goes crazy, right? We're incredibly competitive. Um, if you remember, there's a line in the movie that says, how did we become number two in a two-dog race? And so, amazingly, in 1958, we speed things up, we turn it into aerospace, we get, um, <coughs> excuse me, lots of federal funding, funding from a National Education Act, and then, um, NACA officially becomes NASA. And so this is like the headlines from the New York Times about you know the Soviet Union leaving the Earth and we are extremely distressed by this. Okay, so one of the women I just wanted to highlight in my talk today that isn't profiled in the movie, um, but I talk about in my book is this woman named Annie Easley. And so Annie Easley worked at one of the two um, NASA's that wasn't in segregated space. She was in the Cleveland, Ohio one. So Annie Easley was born in 1933 in Birmingham, Alabama. In 1955, she moved to Cleveland. She saw an ad in the newspaper for computers, applied for the job. She ends up being one of four black employees of NASA. So since there are only four of them, she actually works um, side by side with the white women. What's interesting, however, is they come into the job, they take a picture of the women doing their work on the team, and then they put the picture in the newsletter. When the newsletter comes out, Annie Easley's not in the picture. And she's not in the picture because even though it's the 1950s and it's post-Brown versus Board, people's sensibilities are still somewhat that they weren't sure if they should show that there was a black employee there. So that's how her career started. Her career ends on a much happier note because this is the image of her on the cover of the science and engineering newsletter about 10 years later. She ends, on, ends up on the cover of that newsletter because she was one of the first black women that ended up starting as a computer but becoming an engineer. The way that she became an engineer was that she went to Cleveland State University at night, paid for her own classes, which is interesting because if you were a white man that worked at NASA, they would pay your tuition. They wouldn't pay her tuition, but she found the money, she took the classes, she became an engineer, and she learned Fortran, which of course was the language that she needed to learn um, to move to the next level. If you remember from the movie, one of my favorite scenes is when Dorothy Vaughn goes into the library. The librarian is upset because she's not in the colored section. Then she gets on the bus. She and her sons are sitting in the back of the bus. Even though this is six years after Rosa Parks, she's still sitting in the back of the bus. And then her sons realize she's stolen the book. They are appalled. Their mother is a thief, right? And so she's like, don't pay that any attention. I pay my taxes. This book belongs to me, right? And I was like, exactly. Um, and so it's that kind of subversive behavior that these black women had to execute if they were going to get around the Jim Crow lifestyle, get around segregation, and better themselves, also so that they wouldn't become obsolete, right? Because they knew at some point you weren't going to need computers. They knew um, as human beings, they knew that um, the machine computers were going to take over and the only way to stay employed would be to be able to program the computers. 
The other thing that I love about Annie Easley's story is that she was actually involved in the civil rights movement. And that's something that you don't pick up from the movie, but I know to be absolutely true. All these women would have been invested in the civil rights movement because no matter how ideologically conservative you could have been, you didn't want to live in segregation. So when Annie Easley first started voting, she was charged a poll tax. Okay, now think about it. She was born in 1933. So if she were alive, she would be about 84 years old. So this is someone like in our lifetime. And um, they told her, but well, we're only going to charge you $2 because you have a four-year degree. She'd been to Xavier University, which was a historically black college in Louisiana. So she worked really hard during um, the voting rights movement of the 1960s to dismantle those kinds of things. And then she ends up being the first EEO employee of NASA. And so what I think is great about the Annie Easley story is that she also worked on this, which is the Centaur. So this is a black woman who simultaneously worked on a rocket ship and was involved in the civil rights movement. Something I know that when I was growing up, you couldn't have possibly learned about in school, and that's why I wanted to write this book, so that when students come to me as undergrads, they w might know this story, and then we can talk about it even more um, on a deeper level. Okay, so this here is the actress Michelle Nichols. Um, many of us are familiar, Lieutenant Uhura from Star Trek. And so um, one of the fun things that I learned while I was researching this book was that the difference between the black women and the white women at NASA, the histories that they had, was that when World War II ended, as many of us know, the country really prospered. Then we built interstates, and then suburbia got built up. The white men came back from war. They got great jobs. This made it such that the white women could afford to stay at home. And so white women weren't employed at NASA as much in the 1960s and 70s. Black women, however, stayed the entire time. And it was partly because the black men didn't have the economic opportunities that the white men did, so they couldn't afford to stay at home. So what you have is this like consistent workforce of black women at NASA. My grandmother actually worked there until 66, um, and then she took very ill and she passed away um, in 67. Um, but she was only 60 years old. So if she hadn't taken ill, she would have worked there much, much longer. Um, and so what NASA realized was having these employees was incredibly beneficial. And so what they did was they hired Nichelle Nichols to be a spokeswoman of sorts for NASA to recruit women and men of color to join up with NASA, which was like this great thing because people were really into Star Trek in the late 60s and 70s. And so it ended up being this big boost. So if you look at the employees at NASA now, it's very robust in terms of people of color. And it's partly because of the consistency and the effort that they put in. Okay, so I wanted to share this with you and say this is a living history. And so what this image here is, the teenager on the pillow on the floor is actually my mom, who's now 81. The two young guys on the end are my uncles. And then um, the couple on the sofa, that's my grandfather who taught at Hampton. And then that's my grandmother um, who was the computer at NASA. Mm -hmm.